for.
morning from First Baptist Church of Redmond. I'm glad that you're here, either online or uh, in person. And um, I sent out a thank you for uh, people who uh, stream and watch because um, we had uh, at least 44 people uh, look online on the service. So uh, I'm always glad that anybody uh, joins us um, in church. Uh, we'll start with uh, the V Missionary Church's meeting today. Um, from, uh, I think, 1 p.m., uh, they always start. Uh, they have a, um, a meal together, and um, they uh, close at about uh, 6 or 7 o'clock at night. But what was Awana's theme last week? Say it. Grand Prix. Grand Prix night. He was shot by my, by daughter Brittany. Yeah. Mr. Norman. Will she crash? Where's the Pinewood Derby? Where's the Pinewood Derby? Well, um, we'll show it. Because these are the true powers behind the throne. Um, I'd like to thank um, Russ Norman and um, uh, Tom Bird for all their work. Hooray! Uh, many people, other, um, other people helped, uh, but um, uh, uh, you're right, um, uh, Todd was the caller, but um, these are the powers behind the throne, and it went pretty smoothly, I think. You see the Pinewood Derby? We actually have a Pinewood Derby, and um, the uh, children had to sit on the uh, right side, and the adults could sit on the left side. So um, you see um, uh, Daniel Schlepping, uh, um, Emily Schlepped uh, as well, and Barbara did some Schlepping. So, and we had a car with lights. Wow. Oh, two cars with lights? Wow, I uh, uh, didn't notice one. And that was the start. Barbara's inspecting, so Russ is uh, setting him up, and uh, that was um, a lot of our merry crowd. So, and um, Daniel Page and Brittany were the fastest in open class, but who were the winners um, in this class? Okay, yeah. and uh, that was for what group? Okay. Okay, and what was this group? Yep. Hooray! So um, you can clap for them all, and everybody could have uh, had a good time. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. And um, thank you for all the hard work, uh, both uh, taking it down and setting it back up for church. Hooray! So, next week's theme is Awana Yellow Night. Uh, I don't know what to do with for Yellow Night. I have one. Yep. Uh, I have um, one yellow T-shirt and one yellow uh, sweatshirt, uh, but um, I hope it's uh, not as warm as it is today if I would choose to wear my uh, sweatshirt. So, schedule, uh, AM Church, and Awana Yellow Night, and Women's Bible Study, but um, I want to mention that um, uh, I didn't put on the next work day. Uh, it's um, going to be in June, correct? July 9th, um, right on your uh, screen, July 9th. Well, uh, you can uh, do it uh, as appropriate, but July 9th is the next work day. Yeah, we appreciate um, uh, your giving. Um, we couldn't um, do it without you, and um, you can give it um, on uh, the Tithely app we've set, uh, set up. You can uh, give cash or check or... Um, uh, in kind, so thank you. But 
Lily Bird's birthday is when? What? It's on yellow night. Uh, so you wear yellow. And we have a candy bar specially for you. It's a, a big special candy bar. So Lily, if you forget it, um, I might uh, eat it because uh, I like the candy bar. So anyway, we'll sing happy birthday to Lily. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to you. Happy birthday dear Lily. Happy birthday to you. And now we'll uh, transition to the praise team. Please rise for our first hymn, 522, He Lifted Me. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of sin and shame, through grace he Our eyes on him, our souls reborn. 
when the powerful Messiah would appear. With the power to break the chains of sin and death, and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go, in the power of the Spirit to the pray together, we'll start the stream of background music so you can speak your prayer request.
object lessons for kids. Uh, Daniel, uh, don't get up yet, but you'll be giving me assistance because we're going to do something I've never done before. We're going to practice the gift of levitation. Hooray! A smattering of applause. Okay. We're going to make a static flyer. And you can do it at home. You can do it at home. Um, let me give you the ingredients you'll need. You'll need a cotton towel. You'll need a uh, plastic produce bag. Um, um, Daniel used uh, a bag uh, from uh, Brittany got it. And um, it's like you uh, get at the grocery store and um, you put vegetables in it. Uh, you'll see it. You'll need some scissors. You'll need a balloon. And uh, kids, um, you should have adult supervision because you can't run with scissors. Yes, yes, okay. How will it happen? Okay, Daniel, will you give me some assistance? Yeah. First, Daniel will um, uh, take the balloon and take the towel, cotton towel, and rub the balloon uh, carefully but uh, vigorously. So, you make a squeaking sound, yeah. Okay? And he'll um, take uh, the plastic uh, bag remains and rub them together. <laughs> Unfold it. Okay? And he'll practice the skill of levitation. <laughs> he is levitating it as if by some superstitious power. He'll be able to do it for a long time. Um, you can keep doing it or quit, but um, I'm going to talk about the power. Hooray! He'll keep the balloon, hooray! How did it happen? I'll tell you. When you rub something that's plastic or rubber with a cotton uh, content um, towel, the cotton content towel gives both of them a negative, negative charge. So when you have two things that have a negative charge, do they attract? or do they repel? They repel, uh, just as um, if one side uh, of the magnet uh, easily connected, but um, you take uh, the magnets apart and tr uh, try to put together, and um, it has a force uh, that you can detect. So um, um, it's not magic, it's science. But how often in our experience, do we feel that God is moving in a strange way? We try to do things and have resistance. We try to obey God and we have a struggle. We try to do simple tasks but have a struggle. We struggle with faithfulness so often. Um, we struggle to have a disciplined prayer life. We struggle to have a difficult, um, well, uh, we have a difficult time uh, reading the Bible. Uh, fortunately, I um, have an excuse to read the Bible every day. But um, even I um, need to read the Bible, not professionally, but for myself. I can't help but um, read the Bible and uh, be affected but I need to read the Bible for my own profit. Isaiah 41.10 tells us the result of all the 
discipline and the trust and the prayer life we should have because it will lead us to this conviction. Do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. God in this verse tells us that he strengthens us for what he requires. He will strengthen, help, and uphold you with his right hand that is strengthened by his righteousness. So we do not fear to do service for God. We do not fear to obey. We do not fear to do anything if it's for God. That's harder to say than it's, um, it's uh, able to do. But we should not fear because fear keeps us from obeying. Um, I'd like to um, introduce Daniel for our morning scripture reading today. Please rise and join me in reading John 5.39. You examine the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is in scriptures that testify about me. You may be seated. Part, part five. Why, um, uh, the entire chapter is a transition chapter in my thinking because the entire chapter is based on uh, presenting for, vividly for the first time in John the Jews' opposition and efforts to kill Jesus. They're planning to kill Jesus because um, he stands alone, because he says that um, God is his father. He uh, heals uh, without respecting them, the Jews, the Sanhedrin. So um, it's part five because um, he's uh, going to stop their... Um, Discussion. Um, chapter 5 took place in a very short time, I think, uh, a couple hours. Um, but um, John wrote most of it down for us, and it's important because Jesus very clearly indicated that he did his Father's work. And he did his Father's work because he saw what the Father was willing to do through him. So um, it didn't matter what anybody else said. Uh, he um, obeyed his father first. Let's talk about um, President Abraham Lincoln. The Wall Street Journal writer Joseph Epstein notes that um, the opinion poll has been around for more than a century. Uh, they gained authority in the 1940s with the polling methods of George Gallup. Now we put uh, way too much stock in opinion polls. Epstein writes, so endemic polling um, uh, uh, feels that um, what a politician does is less important than uh, what the public approves of or disapproves. President Abraham Lincoln is an example of how to seek wise counsel and input from others without letting it ruin or run your life. Epstein writes, early in his presidency, he set aside the morning office hours to receive visitors, 
many seeking favors or attempting to exert influence or mere, uh, merely reaching uh, to shake the hand of the nation's leader. These visits offered the president the opportunity in these days before scientific public opinion polling to get some idea of how ordinary people felt about him and his administration. Yet Lincoln was aware uh, of public sentiment. He never allowed it to ultimately alter his policies or principles, which is one of the reasons he was a great man. I'm showing you a picture. Um, it's of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's in the square, red square, on the day he gave the Gettysburg Address. Uh, it's, um, to my knowledge, uh, and I looked for it, the only picture surviving uh, to this day of uh, President Lincoln before he gave the Gettysburg Address. Some critics blasted his uh, 272 word Gettysburg Address for being too short. But this, uh, the speech um, was stood by, by him. And as we all know it now, it became one of the greatest political speeches of all time. Jesus' words in this section, John 5, 33 through 47, are no less notable than the Gettysburg Address because he's um, listing the testimony that was given for him. He's uh, going to talk about uh, John the Baptist, his works, the Father's words, and scripture. Uh, as um, Daniel read, you examine the scriptures because you think that them, uh, you have eternal life. And it's those very scriptures that testify about me. So Jesus gives a number of reasons why the Jews and uh, their leadership should have believed in him and trusted in him because he had the testimony of support. People who actually knew him and saw him and um, he did miracles for. Uh, the references uh, to the testimony of John, which is found in chapter 1, verse 19 to 28, and uh, had uh, been given to a, a delegation that had been sent to him. Um, I'll read um, John uh, 3, uh, 28 through 30 now. You yourselves are witnesses. Um, this is the words of John the Baptist. Uh, you yourselves are witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who is the bridegroom, uh, he has the bride, is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. This is a testimony of John the baptizer. In brief, it amounts to these words that I read before. Why did Jesus mention this testimony of the baptizer? Was it because he needed um, it for himself? No. After all, he says, I in my part do not accept mere human testimony. But the testimony I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He changes the topic. On the contrary, he said these things because this testimony regarding him was true. And in order that they would be saved, take it to heart and be converted. Says Jesus, I say these things again in order that you may be saved. John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him 
might be saved. He was the lamp. Uh, he's speaking of the John the Baptist. Uh, he was the lamp that was burning and shining. And you, will, um, you were willing to rejoice in it for a while while in his light. Uh, while Jesus calls himself the light, he calls John the lamp. And a lamp must be lit and his wick must be fed with oil. It illumines a very little space. Jesus himself uh, is described as a lamp in Revelation 23. This uh, has the same offer, uh, John the Apostle. He is the lamp of the New Jerusalem is what it says. The emphasis on 535, this first currently, is on the fact that the baptizer, John the baptizer, as a lamp, was burning and shining so that as a result, it attracted, he attracted people to Jesus Christ. In his light, that was the point. Just as the lamp attracts moths, so the baptizer attracted a bunch of people. Did not even Herod Antipas hear him gladly in Mark 6.20, which says, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. And we, uh, when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. The main purpose of re, uh, his remark was, however, to point out that though thrill-seekers had been willing enough to rejoice for a while in the light of the baptizer's lamp, but they, not, uh, had, uh, they had not been willing to accept his testimony regarding Christ unto and to be saved. But the testimony I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. I'll read John 8, uh, 17 through 18. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. The other witness is the Father who sent me. That made the Jews infuriated. The Father's own testimony by means of the works of Christ certainly surpasses the indirect testimony given by John the baptizer. These works, such as the miracle uh, in the first part of John chapter 5, these works, to be sure, do not if, uh, themselves produce faith, but they are never as important as are the words of our Lord. Jesus did not come as a miracle worker. He worked miracles, but Jesus did not come as a miracle worker. He came primarily as a prophet, as a teacher. He was the promised Messiah. He was the Christ, but... They needed to listen to his words for them to find meaning, for them to find a foundation, for them to not be moved because they were standing on the words of the Lord, the rock. Nevertheless, they uh, must not be ignored. They should serve to strengthen faith. And the Father who sent me has testified about me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. Um, he spoke clearly one time, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. There had been a voice from heaven at the baptism, to which the baptizer alludes to in uh, John one thirty four. Then there is um, also the witness of the Father in the hearts of other believers. Nevertheless, here in this passage, as is clearly indicated by the immediate following context, 
It is especially the Father's testimony. How? In Old Testament scriptures. He moved, he inspired, he um, directed the prophets to write about Jesus. It is the Father's testimony in the Old Testament scriptures, I think, that is meant. The voice is, of course, of Christ himself. John 14, 29. And now I have told you before it takes place so that uh, when it does take place, you may believe. Jesus is speaking. The form of God, too, is the Christ. The hostile Jews have failed to see in Jesus the voice and the form, nature of God. They have failed through unbelief. Also because you do not have his word remaining in you because you do not believe him who he had sent. The failure is always in not believing and not trusting. I've said before, what does God want most from us? God wants us to trust him. God wants us to believe him because if we trust him, if we believe him, um, if we believe his words, the words of Jesus and the words of the Father as directed by the Holy Spirit, we will not only be saved, but we will construct through faith in Christ an obedience that um, surpassing all others. The reference in verse 37 is distinctly to the hostile attitude of the hearers. Jesus does not deny that in a sense the Jews have the word of God, but in the one whom he sent, in him there is not found belief. They were not able to see because the veil of unbelief was lying upon the eyes of their hearts. You examine the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is those very scriptures that testify about me. It is not at all the intention of Jesus to help uh, his opponents that, that their sin consists in this, that they do not search the scriptures. Many Jews were experts in the law. Many Jews uh, knew the Old Testament. Uh, they went beyond it to uh, learn the Mishnah, but they searched the scriptures with blindness. On the contrary, he uh, desire, uh, desires to rivet their attention upon this important truth. Though you have the books of Moses, and though you have them even set your hope upon them, nevertheless, they will not profit you, will rather testify against you, because you do not see me in them. Jesus does not deny that in the Old Testament, the scriptures, men have eternal life. They can find your eternal life. If the Jews think of our sacred writings as being potentially means of grace, they are right. What the Lord wishes to impress on them, however, is this. You fail to see me revealed in these scriptures, and yet it is they that testify concerning me. The whole, whole testament is based on prefiguring Christ. John the baptizer came in fulfillment of a verse from Malachi uh, chapter 4 uh, that uh, God would send uh, in this case, his cousin, to reveal and um, pave the way for the coming of Christ. 
and you are yet unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Back of this blindness is the unwilling heart. They do not want to come to me in order that you may have life. I think I was destined to be saved. Um, my life as a young adult, um, well, um, as a child, um, my parents always t uh, trusted that God would save me. And um, I told you that um, it was on Memorial Day weekend um, that I trusted Christ as Savior. Uh, I was 11 years old. Uh, before my um, birthday in October. But I didn't tell them I had gotten saved. Uh, I don't know why, but um, I don't know why. Um, I was ashamed to tell them that I got saved because um, I didn't want to, uh, uh, um, them to think that um, I was a religious extremist. Uh, isn't that crazy? But um, they could tell because I had a fresh interest in writing the Bible, in learning the Bible. I um, hand wrote all the uh, verses and psalms that were prophetic about Jesus Christ. So um, my mother would come and uh, uh, tell me, oh, um, uh, what are you writing in your notebook? Oh, uh, I'm writing Bible verses. And um, she could tell uh, I was changed. And um, the following summer, uh, they suggested, you know what, um, if you're uh, really saved, uh, you should uh, be immersed. So I thought about it, and um, uh, I was baptized uh, at the age of 12. The real meaning is this. In your hardness of heart, you have basely rejected the Son of God. I do not receive glory from people, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Wow, what a statement. But I know you. What did the um, Christ, the Son of God, know about them? They do not have the love of God in yourselves. That's a scary statement. Jesus, who know, uh, knew them thoroughly, and was able to read their very hearts, answers by saying, praise for men, I do not accept. He does not seek it, and is even not willing to receive it as the valid praise of unbelievers. Then Jesus gives his own answer to the question respecting the reason for his controversy with the Jews. The real reason is not his yearning for praise, but their lack of love toward God. What is supposed to be the number one Christian distinctive? We love God and we love our neighbor as ourselves. That's supposed to be the number one Christian distinctive is love for God and love for other people. Had there been this love in their hearts, they would, of course, had accepted the Father's testimony concerning his Son. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Wow, what a statement. Uh, people will believe everything but the truth, amen? I uh, am amazed um, when I study comparative religions to um, think of what um, millions of people will accept as their God. Though he had come in the name of the Father, not only at his wish, but definitely to reveal him by word and deed, yet they had not accepted him. They had stubbornly rejected him. If another comes in his own name, you will accept him. His uh, prophecy was fulfilled over and over again. Why? Some examples. One false messiah was named Thutis. Another, Judas of Galilee, that uh, made it in the Bible, Acts uh, 5. Then came Bar Kokhba. Uh, the Bar Kokhba um, instigated a revolt 
against um, Rome that um, led to the destruction of Israel and its renaming is uh, Elea Capitolina. The distinguished rabbi Akiba called him the star of Jacob that was mentioned in Numbers 24, 17. The last one will be the Antichrist himself. All of these present themselves without their proper credentials. They come, notice, in their own name. Second Thessalonians 2, they could be saved, but they will refuse to love the truth and accept it. Yet people yield their all to them. They lead many astray. How can you believe when you accept glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Not only is it true that the Jews do not believe, they actually cannot believe either as in as much as they're in constantly seeking praise from men, not the praise that comes down from God. The very name Jew, Judah. Um, Judah is um, why are, um, they call Jews. Uh, it's the Hebrew word for praise. But um, it was uh, the name of the largest tribe. And um, uh, the um, uh, case was... Um, it's the largest tribe, and so they're called Jews. But um, they sought praise from men, not from God. It is the wrong kind of honor springing from the wrong source which, are, uh, which they are seeking. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have put your hope. In John 9, uh, he goes back to this topic. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are the disciples of Moses, the Jews said. Again and again, the Jews have appealed to Moses and boast, we are the disciples of Moses. Now Jesus tells them, Moses, the constant object of their hope who, um, to whose scriptures they were always appealing, whose instructions they debated and analyzed with hair-splitting casuistry would actually prove to be their accuser. The reason being that, in spite of all their boasting about being his followers, they in reality did not believe him, did not believe Moses. For if you believed Moses... You would believe me, for he wrote of me. Moses wrote about me uh, that um, Christ is indeed the heart and soul of the writings of the uh, entire Old Testament, not only of Moses. The entire Pentateuch, uh, the uh, five books of the law, points forward to the coming of Christ and definitely prepares the way for his arrival. There are four lines which, running through the whole Old Testament, converge at Bethlehem and Calvary. His birth and death are the most prophesied words in the entire Old Testament. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus was saying, uh, I paraphrase, you Jews are always saying that nothing is as sacred as the written Torah. You place that written law above everything else, certainly above any words which anyone might utter. Also, you regard Moses as your chief leader and vie with one another in praising his memory. As you see it, no one living today could possibly compare with him. Therefore, if his writings you do not believe, how you believe my words. The Jews needed this lesson of faith. 
and so do we today. I don't know how many people um, go to church all their lives and they miss this lesson. They miss the lesson that they need to come to Jesus. They need to trust Jesus because we know how to act in church. We know how to conduct ourselves. We know when to say amen. We know uh, when to nod our heads. But that's no substitute for meeting the Lord and Savior of the world. And it's difficult to keep knowing Jesus a secret for us. As has been shown, these witnesses, the witnesses of, um, uh, received by John the Baptizer, the Father's works, the Father's own testimony, and the testimony and witness of Scripture are hardly to be regarded as so many separate witnesses. Rather, it is the Father who testifies by means of all the rest. The Father, His God, the God of the ages, gives evidence through John the baptizer who led the way, through the Son obeying the works that he was shown that his father wanted done. Even the words of the father has testified about me and the testimony of the Old Testament scriptures. Have you uh, played this before? We used to play it frequently. Um, I want to tell you uh, the history. I didn't know um, because we don't have a new copy of the game of life. It has changed. What is the goal of life? Uh, To accumulate the most money. To accumulate the most money. This is what one can learn from reading the obituary of Reuben Klammer, the creator of board uh, game, The Game of Life. He died September 14th, 2021, at the age of 99. When the game of life was introduced in 1960, the purpose was to earn the most wealth. The way you got there was simple enough. By going to college, getting a job, buying insurance, saving for retirement, that was indicative of um, what sold in that era Uh, a former Hasbro um, vice president said. Over time, designers realized that the game didn't reflect consumers' changing views of life goals. So they gave it a big update uh, in 2007. Um, We have a, for a 2007 uh, game board, allowing players to score points for virtuous deeds like saving an endangered species, opening a health food chain, and recycling. And instead of starting the game at point A and finishing at point Z, there is no fixed path. You decide how you want to spend your time. What question um, that popped up is, if the popular view of what matters in life changed so much in less than 50 years, What's to say it won't shift again? But as Jill Laporte writes um, in uh, the New Yorker magazine, the redesigned teams have always had a hard time addressing the fundamental criticism of the game, that the only way to reward a player worth virtuous asks uh, was money. Save an endangered species, collect $200,000. Find a solution to pollution, gain $250,000. Open a health food chain, gain $100,000. So, the company's 2007 overhaul, the game of life, twist 
and turns was almost existential. Instead of putting players on a fixed path, it provided multiple ways to start out in life. But there was nowhere to finish. This is actually the game's selling point. It has no goal, Ms. Laporte wrote. The life is aimless. What is the meaning of life? This is the, the question that many older but many younger people wrestle with. Many of them do not find a truly satisfying answer that satisfies their deepest longings for significance. Only in Christ do we find answers for life. Our purpose in the universe and the multiverse and what awaits us in eternity, only in Christ. Please rise for the closing hymn, hymn eight, praise to the Lord the Almighty. We'll sing two stanzas. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Know my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the amen sound from his people again. Gladly for I we adore him. Amen. It's related to the Hebrew word for truth. So when you say amen, you're saying that in God's strength, in God's ability, what I say in prayer, what I say um, with regards to God is echoing uh, in truth. So when uh, you say amen, you're saying that you trust God to do what is true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that all who are within my voice can realize where they stand before eternity. Jesus, knowing him, trusting him, trusting God's words about him is the key to our salvation. If we trust that we have sinned and we can't make up for anything, uh, our righteousness is um, filthy, but in Christ, we can find redemption. In Christ, we find a fresh start. In Christ, anyone who comes to God with faith will be saved because we have no other means of redemption. I pray that everyone will trust that message. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. You're expressing a truth. Thanks, and I'm um, glad to see you.